Hi everyone, we'll be starting in just a few minutes, so hang tight, but welcome and we're so excited to have you all here. So we'll just give it a few more minutes. All right. Hi, everyone. I think it's about time we can get started. Uh, we still have some people trickling in, so welcome. We're excited to all have you here tonight as we talk about climate change and its impact on children. Um, my name is Morgan. If you haven't met me already, I work with our community engagement team, and I'm just here to introduce Alicia, who will be presenting tonight. Um, so Alicia, let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, she works on our global programs team. She's the assistant director and focuses on the following programs, WASH, Climate, Energy, and the Environment, Maternal and Newborn Health, Gender, and HIV and AIDS. Um, she also supervises the UNICEF Relations and Program Strategy Workstream. Before she came to UNICEF USA, though, she worked as the Executive Director of Peace Action New York State and as the Research Associate for the Strategic Security Program and UN Affairs at the Federation of American Scientists in DC. So we're really excited to have Alicia here. Um, she knows so much about this topic and we're really excited to teach you all about it. Um, so a few things before we get started, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A and you have a chat. 
feel free to use the chat to talk to each other. You can share where you're from. We love seeing you guys from around the country. Um, so that's for you and the other participants. Use the Q&A function though to share any questions. So after this presentation, we'll have some time with Alicia to talk about, um, for her to answer questions. And so please use the Q&A function and we will answer your question at the end. Um, and you'll also notice that you aren't able to talk or turn on your video and that's, um, that is normal and that's how it's supposed to be, but you can use the chat feature to talk to each other. So without further ado, I think that covers the logistics end of things. We'll go ahead and turn it over to Alicia. The floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Morgan. And thanks to everybody for joining tonight. And I wish we were all together in DC at the summit, but, um, I'm glad to be doing this with you this way anyway. So I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen, I should say, for the first time ever. So let's see what happens. Hopefully that worked. Are you all seeing my presentation? I'm just gonna assume that you are. If you're not, somebody can tell me. Um, okay, so here we go. Okay, so what is climate change? We're gonna start with that very simple seeming question. Um, the UN definition is a change of climate that's attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that alters the composition of the global atmosphere and that is in addition to natural climate variability observed over comparable time periods. So we have greenhouse gases, GHGs, that trap warmth from the sun, so we are able to live on this planet, but humans have drastically increased the concentration of GHGs, and that is increased global temperatures. About two-thirds of GHG is carbon dioxide, which is largely the product of burning fossil fuels. So this picture that you're looking at is a picture of a, a boy in a country in the Central Pacific Ocean called Kiribati, and he's walking home from school. And you can see um, the very real effect of climate change and rising sea levels on his life. Um, many villages become flooded during the high tide, and so this is part of daily life in his country. Let's see if I can move the... Aha, okay, great. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is the large uh, overarching framework where the global community has gotten together to try to address climate change. Um, it was created in 1992 after the UN's Earth Summit as a first step in addressing climate change and specifically to prevent human interference with the climate system. The convention has near universal membership and 197 states parties. And you may have seen or heard of these other next two, Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement. Um, their protocols to this uh, UNFCCC, uh, and they are basically commitments of state developed states parties to reduce emission targets. And then in the Paris Agreement for developed countries to help support developing countries in their climate change response. Uh, the Climate Action Summit took place last year in September and focused on um, how the private sector could also help mitigate the effects of climate change. And then just to add, the Nobel Peace Prize was given in 2007 to uh, former US Vice President Al Gore and the IPCC for their climate change work. So how does climate change affect children? That's what we're really here to talk about. Um, so UNICEF's key message on climate change is that children are the least responsible for it, but the most vulnerable to its effects. So that's the number one message that UNICEF wants you to remember about climate change. And climate change impacts children disproportionately, including through these things that you see here. And for example, the lack of safe water and undernutrition or floods happen from climate change and they compromise water and sanitation facilities. Um, they flood and they pollute water supplies. 
children are very vulnerable to waterborne diseases and diarrhea is very, can be fatal for young children, also leads to cholera and malnutrition. And every day more than 700 children die under the age of five from diseases related to unsafe water sanitation and hygiene. Another example is pneumonia and asthma from indoor and outdoor air pollution. Approximately 2 billion children live in areas where air pollution levels exceed WHO standards and they're breathing toxic air. And indoor air pollution from coal stoves and cooking is also um, a factor for pneumonia and causes 4.3 million deaths a year. And something that I didn't know before I started in on this work was uh, a child's lungs develop until they're 18. And so until a child is 12 years old, their average breathing rate is twice that of an adult. So with all these children living in areas with toxic indoor and outdoor air, they're actually continually breathing in and out much more of this toxic air than adults are. So that's how climate change can affect children disproportionately. So there are a couple of strategies. Uh, they're not UNICEF specific strategies, but UNICEF uses all of them in its response to climate change. Um, resilience, which is the ability of systems and communities that are exposed to a threat to resist, absorb, adapt, and recover in a timely manner. So resilient development means providing children and families with what they need to better prepare for and manage crises and to recover more rapidly. Adaptation, is adjustment to actual or expected effects of climate change. Disaster risk reduction is one key adaptation strategy to identify, assess, and decrease potential losses from the impacts of natural hazards. And then mitigation refers to human intervention to reduce the sources of greenhouse, greenhouse gases or to enhance the sinks, things that can absorb greenhouse gases. And here you see a picture of a woman in Mozambique earlier this year um, after the two devastating cyclones hit. Uh, that is um, part of a hospital that was destroyed. So a little bit more on greenhouse gases, which are the main drivers of climate change. Um, toxic air is largely caused by carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases. And as we discussed before, uh, the toxic air can contribute uh, greatly to pneumonia and other problems causes around 600,000 children under five every year to die from pneumonia and respiratory problems. Uh, but despite knowing the dangers of toxic air, many places with high levels of pollution still don't have monitoring systems on the ground. For example, only 6% of children in Africa live within 50 kilometers of ground level monitoring for toxic air. So this is a real problem. And this photo here is from a gas field in Nigeria shooting um, the gas flames up into the atmosphere. So this slide uh, talks about water and the climate crisis. Another thing that UNICEF really uh, likes to emphasize about the climate crisis is that water is inextricably linked to it. So we know that warmer temperatures lead to rising sea levels, increased flooding, droughts, melting ice, all of this affects not just the reliability of of qu the quantity of water, but the quality of water. So water can get polluted and formerly safe sources of water can become unsafe to drink, um, including from human excrement from latrines or even from areas where there's open defecation, which is still happening in lar large parts of the world. And again, uh, wash, poor water quality leads, leads to diseases like cholera and diarrhea, which can be deadly for young children. Another thing to think about is that the growing demand for water increases the need for energy intensive water pumping, also transportation and water treatment. And all of this releases extra greenhouse gases and also takes away from the greenhouse gas sinks. So one, one stark fact to leave you with from this slide is some 600 million children, or that's about one in four children around the world, will be living in areas where water demand far outstrips water supply by 2040. Okay, it's trivia time. Mor um, Morgan or Rebecca, are you gonna lead the trivia game? Sure, um, I sure can. Um, so the first question up here is, globally, how many children now live in areas of extreme, sorry, extreme high risk of floods due to extreme weather? We have A, B, or C, 503 million, 
208 billion or 4,000? You can chat in um, your answer. Do you think it's A, B, or C? Right. Got a lot of answers coming in, a lot of A's. Alicia, do you wanna go ahead and press next? 503 million, you guys were correct. Most of you had that one, so good, good work. All right, our next question here. Um, by 2040, um, how many children will be living in areas where water demand far outstrips supplies? A, 200 million, B, 300, or C, 600 million? I gave it away. <laughs> hey, a lot of people are going ahead and getting it. So let's see, you're right, 600 million. All right. Sorry, guys. Screen sharing faux pas. Okay. <laughs> so, what is UNICEF doing to protect children from the effects of climate change? Well, we have uh, this is a relatively new area for UNICEF. Um, over the past couple of years, they've really built out their climate energy and environment strategy and team at headquarters. It used to be actually um, subsumed in the water sanitation and hygiene team, but now it's its own cross-cutting its own cross-cutting area. So this this um, picture is of UNICEF strategy. It's a four-point strategy that um, you can hopefully you can read uh, all the details when you get the presentation, but just to go over the basics, the strategy includes making children a focus of environmental strategies, empowering children as agents of change, protecting children from the impacts of climate change, and reducing emissions and pollution. So for example, each one of these strategy points has a call that UNICEF is doing, and then an action that UNICEF itself is taking. So in number four, reduce emissions and pollution, UNICEF is calling for ambitious commitments and actions from governments and business to reduce global emissions and pollution to levels to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And UNICEF will reduce its own environmental footprint and promote low carbon approaches in programs. Then we have to implement this strategy, UNICEF is gonna focus on four programmatic areas. Climate smart health centers, reducing exposure to pollution, and that includes air, soil, and water pollution, um, climate smart schools, and climate resilient wash services. So for example, a climate smart health center or school might have renewable solar energy to keep the lights on, to power medical equipment and vaccine refrigerators, um, and provide excess generated electricity to the villages. So this slide kind of speaks to the strategy we were just talking about, but I wanna kind of explain that not only does UNICEF do a lot of programmatic work, but also does advocacy, what we like to call upstream level work. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that term. So in addition to working on field, in the field on programs, we support all levels of government um, to advocate for change and for government support, financial support to make programs sustainable in the long term. So for example, um, for reducing emissions and pollution, UNICEF would be advocating in one country X and with Corporation Y to help them make and keep ambitious commitments for reducing emissions and pollution and for promoting low carbon development. And this picture here that you see is actually um, an example of youth engagement. It's um, in Kyrgyzstan, where they have a volunteering initiative on school safety and the, the, the volunteers at schools are engaged in an online advocacy campaign to raise awareness of school safety and improve the skills of students practicing safe behavior during disasters like fires and earthquakes. So that's a great way that UNICEF helps to engage youth in its climate programming. And I think this goes over to Becca now. but you are on mute. Oh. There you go. Okay, can you all hear me now? Yes? Yes, we can. Okay. Awesome. Um, I'm Becca, I'm the Advocacy and Engagement Fellow at UNICEF USA, and I've worked a lot on our climate advocacy here in the US. So climate change, combating climate change, pollution, and environmental degradation are becoming one of the highest priorities of UNICEF globally. 
and we are doing our part here in the United States through some, through, through some of the advocacy work um, that we are initiating here domestically. So we're reminded right now during the current public health crisis that global problems really require global solutions. And while coronavirus is the most urgent threat facing children and all of humanity today, the greatest threat to humanity going forward and in the future is climate change. And Alicia has really shown you how climate change disproportionately affects children and especially the most vulnerable children around the world. So the way that we're interpreting that as an advocacy team here at UNICEF USA is by really ramping up our advocacy work about, on climate issues um, in the United States and around the world. So we've endorsed the International Climate Accountability Act, which is a bill that prohibits the US from withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. And Alicia mentioned the Paris Agreement. Basically, it's United Nations agreement of over 200 countries to reduce emissions at levels that they've determined themselves, so that countries have um, set for themselves. The bill would also call on the US government to create a plan for reaching the US contribution, which is to reduce emissions by at least 26% by 2025. So if this legislation were to be enacted, the United States would most definitely stay in the Paris Agreement and would work to cut emissions in the, this country. And we've created a digital advocacy platform for you to contact your senators in support of this legislation that you can see on the next slide. Um, and you can access that, that activation by texting CLIMATE to 52886 or by clicking on the link, which should be added to the chat box soon. Um, but yes, by texting CLIMATE to 52886 and by typing your information into this little box that's on the screen, you'll send an email to your senators asking them to co-sponsor this piece of legislation. And basically what that does is kind of build momentum and builds support for the bill so that it hopefully passes Congress and becomes law. Okay, next. Okay. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, really happy to be able to tie this to um, some activations domestically. And of course, it would be great if we stopped the US from leaving the Paris Agreement. So let's all text our information to that, that number. Um, so just getting back to what UNICEF is doing on climate change, one of the things that they're committed to doing, as we were saying earlier, is greening themselves. So, um, for example, they re they're trying to reduce waste by um, one of the things they're doing actually is kind of cool. They're replacing plastic bags in um, health kits and education kits with biocompostable bags. So in 2017, um, UNICEF included approximately 20 million of these biocompostable bags in their health kits sent to Burundi. DRC, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. And UNICEF is also working to reduce its environmental footprint in more than 70 offices around the world and counting. The picture that you see here is um, the Haiti country office. And it, it's too bad, like maybe we can send the other picture around, but the top of this building and the building behind it are all covered with solar panels. And this country office receives 100% of its uh, power from the sun. So that's pretty cool. More trivia time. All right, I won't mess it up, I promise this time. Who's, um, Morgan, you wanna lead this? All right, time? yeah, I'm back. <laughs> All right, this time, our first question. Do you know how many children die every year from pneumonia and other respiratory problems before their fifth birthday? You can chat in your answers. We've got a lot of A's. A lot of A's. All right, what's the answer? Uh, you all are correct. Great work. <laughs> you guys are so smart. All right, next up, um, which of these examples, which are these, sorry, there's a typo here. Which of these are examples of energy efficiency? Or I just can't read right. <laughs> um, what do we got? Which are examples? What do you think? G, we got a lot of D's. You guys are all so smart. Do you want to give us the answer? Oh, Great. well done. You guys all ace the test. Nice. Excellent. Um, okay, moving on. That's great. Great work, everybody. 
I feel, I feel validated that you're paying attention to my presentation, so thank you. Um, <laughs> strengthening children's resistance to climate change. So uh, the thing I, I want you to get from all these words on the screen is just that the, the number one thing to remember is that governments are responsible for protecting their populations and for protecting their, the children in their countries. So when it comes to climate change, it's really governments that have to make, make these commitments and stick to these commitments. And UNICEF, of course, is there to provide technical support and advocate and to um, do trainings and all the things that we can do to help support governments and, and help them allocate funds and all those things. But really it's up to governments to make sure that these policies are in place and that children are being included. So here's one way that a government has really taken this to heart. Um, in Zimbabwe, uh, let's see, uh, young people participated in the process to develop the National Climate Change Response Strategy in Zimbabwe and the outputs of the workshops that they participated in were combined with the UNICEF study and actually incorporated into the national strategy. And this is a photo of the president of Zimbabwe um, meeting with one of the, the um, climate ambassadors, child climate ambassadors. And then you have climate change education as mitigation. So what UNICEF is working to do is to educate children because we know that they're the world's future decision makers about climate and environment. So there's formal education, like embedding it in the school curriculum. There's non-formal education, such as going to youth camps and field trips and projects. And then important as well is informal education, which is maybe teaching children who live in flood prone areas to swim so that you know, if disaster strikes, that they can protect themselves. And of course, UNICEF provides platform uh, for children to, to be heard. And important to UNICEF in this regard is to make sure that children are not seen as victims of climate change, but they are agents of change and able to participate. So there's a couple of ways that that happens. You know, there's the Conference of Youth, and Youngo and all of these things are taking place at the UN and are fairly recent. So youth NGOs have recently been invited into the international conversation. And this picture on the right is from um, September's uh, climate marches and activism. It's, it's from New York City. And I don't know, it, it seems kind of weird to think about being in such a big crowd right now, but um, I think I saw a lot of you at the ones in New New York City as we all march down together. So this slide I just kind of included because I'm hoping that you have some interest in this topic and you want to learn a little bit more and the, the, the deck that we've been looking at together today is going to be available for you and you can go there and you can download these really great reports that UNICEF has made about climate change and get some more uh, great information from there. And I think that is the last slide. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm gonna try and stop sharing my screen and see what happens. Okay. Nope. All right, I think it's time for a and a session. Um, so I think for now we will um, answer some of your questions that have come in through our Q&A box, but please share any and all of your questions for us through that. We would love to answer all of them. So send them in and we'll start away. All right. Um, so one, I think, really relevant question that came in um, was about COVID-19 and how do you think um, COVID-19 has benefited or affected and harmed climate change in any way? It's a really great question. And actually, um, UNICEF sent around some guidance just today about um, how COVID-19 is affecting climate change uh, work. And basically, you know, they're saying that there are a lot of things that are similar about the response um, or how they can get involved. For example, um, climate stresses create floods, which create better conditions for vectors that, that have diseases like mosquitoes, which impact children's health and especially for the most vulnerable. So in that way, um, the problems, the, the, the global pandemic that's happening right now 
relates to climate change in that all the the things that we need to be able to do to prevent systems from f falling further behind are being exacerbated and we really need to make sure that we pay attention to the messaging and we pay attention to um, how how the 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 follow-on effects from covid will impact climate change and how climate change itself will impact this and other types of viral infections in the future. And I can send around, uh, th that's internal guidance, but we can send around some talking points um, after the call. Yeah, I think that would be great. I think it's really interesting to know, um, and I'm sure everyone has questions, so maybe we can follow up with a couple in our follow-up email for you all. Um, so this next question is about um, regenerative agriculture. And so we're wondering if you could share your perspective on using localized production or regenerative agriculture and carbon farming as a way to improve soil health. So what do you think, what are your thoughts on those things and how productive and effective are those? That's a really great question. And I have to admit that I'm not really that well versed on agriculture, especially since UNICEF is not uh, really in the food delivery business. Uh, that's more the World Food Program. But I know that um, everything UNICEF does development-wise is sustainable. And as a matter of fact, just uh, earlier this week, um, I was on a, a webinar late at night with uh, the WASH team. They launched uh, finally like some technical guidance for co UNICEF country offices about um, making sure that all water sanitation and hygiene programs are going to be climate resilient from now on into the future. So that's something that UNICEF has been working on and working toward for a long time, but uh, now they're actually issuing guidance and technical notes to make it happen. And so this issue of sustainability and local pr production is very important to UNICEF because doing things locally ensures that there are skills being developed that can be sustained in the community, which is also very good for the economy. And also to make sure that all development is sustainable so that we run ourselves out of business eventually. Awesome, thank you for answering that. I know it's a, it's a tough question, but very um, interesting topic to dive deeper into as well. Um, let's see. Um, have we partnered with any orgs or people to help out our climate change efforts? Are there any specifically that would be beneficial for folks to check out if they're interested in looking up other partners? Yeah, I mean, you, I know mostly about the water sanitation um, partners. There's some UNICEF partners with the Global Water Partnership, GWP it's called, and together they put out many um, technical guidelines for climate resilient wash. Um, even if you just Google the term climate resilient wash plus UNICEF, you'll find a lot of really cool resources about who UNICEF partners with on the ground in terms of policy and in terms of program. Um, there's also really great organizations doing work that is a little bit outside of what we do, like in that sort of deforestation stuff, like the, you know, uh, the world, uh, Wildlife Fund and the National Resources Defense Council here in the US. So there are a lot of great partners out there. And right now UNICEF has really been focused on the WASH aspects, but that is starting to broaden out. And like we were saying before, um, pollution is another big thing that UNICEF is working with. And the UK uh, National Committee for UNICEF has done a lot of great work and they have some reports online about that as well. Awesome, thank you. I think that's a great question that people can definitely dive deeper into. Um, so I like this next question is about community and school-based education. So do you have any thoughts or ways that we could increase or schools could increase um, these educational programs on gardening, agriculture programs, and other educational tools that maybe, you know, could be really beneficial for people to have and for young people to learn about? Absolutely. Um, are, is this question more about a U.S.-based kind of um, education or an international? I would I would say um, let's let's try let's start with um, here in the U.S. first and see if what your thoughts on if, if there's other ways um, and then if you have thoughts on international too. Great. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, thank you for that question. Um, 
it's interesting because I was I've been working on a proposal just today um, for Madagascar about um, about climate education there. And one of the things that the country office in Madagascar is saying is that every single um, classroom that UNICEF builds from now on in Madagascar is going to have a tree planting as part of it and gardening, sports fields, gender separated latrines, all that good stuff. But they're really focusing also on the need to plant trees and the need to plant gardens, which I think is something that is, you know, I live in Brooklyn and in Brooklyn, I know that there are some schools that have gardens and, and rooftop gardens that are spring up in neighborhoods. And this is a really important way to teach people about um, the effects of climate change, especially tree planting and get, even just getting kids, young kids involved in like where their food comes from and how how those types of things really can be tangible and affect them is so important. And I think that I think that the more that people like us can advocate to include that stuff in the curriculum wherever we are, whether it's here or anywhere else, I think that's fantastic. And you know, if you have an opportunity, if you live somewhere maybe where there's more uh, garden space than there is in Brooklyn, maybe have have a go at it because we're doing it in Brooklyn, so you can do it anywhere. I like that. Um, so we're getting a couple questions that covers a lot of people's questions relating to how can they get involved. So there's some key kind of local efforts you could do. We've gotten a couple about clubs specifically. And so I can share maybe a little bit from the club perspective. So if you're part of our UNICEF clubs, or if you're not, you can definitely start one if you're in high school or college. But I think these are great activities. Some of the things that Alicia mentioned, you could definitely do those as part of your UNICEF club. Um, definitely get involved in your community. Obviously, once we are allowed to interact and mingle and go um, be outside, but there's things that we can all do individually um, outside. So I think definitely um, think about ways that you can, especially with Earth Day coming up, there's things that you could do to get involved um, outside. But I think with your UNICEF club, education is a big thing. And we do have this PowerPoint that we'll be sharing publicly on our PowerPoint Center. Um, so I definitely encourage you to share this PowerPoint with your club or your community. There's also a discussion guide paired with it. So it has a lot of great questions um, and we'll share some talking points too, but I think education is a key thing we can all do even while we're social distancing. So definitely start, um, start with there, start with that too. Um, I think following off of that, um, we've got a question too for adults. How, and maybe this is something for all audiences, what do you think are a couple key, um, key tactics for us to, maybe use in our everyday life to live more sustainably? Just a few quick tips to be more sustainable. Is that for me? Yes, for you. Okay, um, that's a really great question. I mean, it's, it's difficult living in um, the modern world and, and, and having a low carbon footprint, but I would say to the extent that it's possible um, to take public transportation, to ride your bicycle instead of driving in a car is a, a huge thing you can do. Um, making sure you conserve energy and all those things like turning off light switches, shutting off the water when you're washing your dishes or brushing your teeth. And, um, you know, it, it's funny because UNICEF talks about how those biocompostable bags are more expensive, but the cost a benefit analysis of using them versus um, not continuing to not use them and put more and more plastic in the world is, um, you know, is so important for UNICEF and it's the same for us, right? We can buy compostable garbage bags and we can buy compostable dog poop bags. They all cost more, um, but in the end, uh, it's something that we can do and it seems small, but um, if you've ever seen a picture of a, a cute little turtle wrapped up in a plastic bag, you know that every time you're you're not throwing one of those in the trash, you're doing something really important. Yeah, thank you for that. Those are we've seen a couple come in through the chat line too. So thank you all for also sharing your tips. But I think together we can definitely do some of those even while we're social distancing, which is important. Um, along the lines of thinking about um, bags and how um, instead of using plastic bags, using organic bags, we've had a question come in asking if UNICEF is working with local communities that we're serving to create some of these products. So for example, using organic bags instead of plastic, are we working with um, some of these local communities out there? 
Well, yeah, we are absolutely. And we have this really great program that maybe some of you have, have heard about. Um, with uh, it's, it, We are calling it the Plastic Bricks Program, but really it's so much more than that. Um, it's a program that's going on in Cote d'Ivoire right now. Um, basically, it has so many great angles to it, but it's a community-led initiative where uh, women are, 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 being, are, are being organized to um, collect plastic waste in the community. So number one, they're getting rid of environmental trash and to potentially toxic plastic trash. Um, number two, they're cutting out the middleman, so they're going to be able to directly sell this plastic to this um, factory that UNICEF is supporting being built in Cote d'Ivoire to, um, to take this plastic that they're being paid for and turn it into lightweight, fire resistant, uh, cyclone resistant um, bricks. And they're building schools all across the country with these bricks. And schools can go up in a matter of like a week or two as opposed to months. And anybody can do it. You don't have to be a trained bricklayer, for example. You can just take a hammer and, and make these schools. And it's such a fantastic program that's one really great example of what UNICEF is doing to work with the local community and do environmental work, train people for sustainability, provide an income, and, and really try to change the game on plastic pollution. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we've got a couple advocacy questions too, so I actually would love to um, tag in Becca, if Becca could, come back into our convo. Um, we'd love to just share again, what are some of those advocacy ways that we can take action? Um, and could you share a little bit more about those? Yeah, so the main way right now is through our online, our digital advocacy activation that I shared with you all. Um, and just writing to your senators and asking them to co-sponsor that legislation and just expressing to them why you care about climate change. I think it's really powerful as a young person to say, this is gonna impact my future, you know, this isn't just a question of right now and like your generation might not even be as affected at, by it as we are, but you know, we are gonna be the people who pay the price for the decisions that we're making right now. And I think that message is most powerful coming from young people. So just continuing to make your voice heard, you know, whether it be through our digital advocacy platform or, you know, if you're in a meeting with a congressional office, we're hosting a few of those in the coming months. Um, mentioning that that's an issue that you care about and then that that's something that's important to you. You can also use social media to spread the word. You can tag your legislators or you can just raise awareness in your community um, about why you care about climate change and what tangible legislative solutions we can use to fight it. Great, thank you so much, Becca. And I believe we just shared, we also shared the link in the chat, so that's awesome. And so you guys can Go check it out. Um, I think that's also a great thing that you can all do since we're social distancing. So that's awesome. Um, let's see, what else? Um, Alicia, uh, we've got a couple questions about fast fashion. Are you, um, is this an area that you could speak to or share a little bit about how maybe we can fight fast fashion and shop more sustainably? And has UNICEF interacted in um, the fashion space? Wow, I, that's an amazing question. I, I haven't heard that term before, so maybe I'm not the best person to answer this question, but I do know that there, I do know just from being interested in this topic for a long time that the fashion industry and the clothing industry is one of the greatest um, strains on, on, you know, on, on the climate for various reasons, and that there's a lot of um, energy around uh, so swapping clothes, recycling clothes, not buying brand new clothes uh, for that reason. But if, if anybody else on the team has any more information than that, I, I don't know too much about it, unfortunately. <laughs> No, I think that's awesome. I know it's um, a newer term and I've watched a great documentary on Netflix about fast fashion. So it's great. But I think there's a lot of good resources out there. Um, and I think some of those things that you mentioned, like recycling clothes um, and just being mindful of where you're buying clothes from and ensuring you're looking at the tag and seeing where it's from. So I think those are a couple ways. Um, and so we can definitely share some more resources later as well. So I think we are 
about to wrap it up, but I would love to end on this question. Um, so somebody asked about how a, how can a child's atmosphere at school reflect on their own view of climate impact? So for example, when a child from a low-income community isn't used to recycling in their community due to their basic necessities that they might be lacking, um, how do you think UNICEF or ourselves can help change their view of climate change and help them see the real danger that we face? That's a really great question. And I think, you know, more, more than, than anything, like pe younger, young people understand that um, we've, you know, people of my age and older, we've ruined the climate for all of you, so sorry. Um, uh, but it's, in schools, I think, I think it's really important, and UNICEF stresses this as well, climate education, and that was one of the things that we talked about before, whether it's formal in school, or it's informal through clubs, camps, um, on even online chats, and then that sort of you know other type of education where you're teaching children like how to swim if they live in flood prone areas. It's so important. Uh, children are definitely the future um, policy makers, and children have a voice that UNICEF has to amplify and has a plat gives them a platform on which to amplify it. Um, if we could if we could get um, schools to commit to doing climate education, I think that would be the most helpful. You really have to, um, there are certain schools that really embrace this, schools that are more kind of progressive, um, but in certain areas of, you know, all around the world, there's other problems that people don't, maybe they're not as in tune to this, but I think as we become, um, more and more affected by the frequent shocks that come multiple times from climate change, whether that's your school being destroyed by a cyclone, or you, you know, you're, you're just the electricity is out because of weather related problems, we're all gonna be forced to look at this in a different way. And I think that's starting to happen now. So the more that we can highlight the, the positive things that can come from um, focusing on education around climate, the, the, the easier it will be in the future to address these changes. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I think with that, we are going to close up our questions. We had a lot of good ones. And if you do still have questions, please feel free to email us and reach out. We will be following up with more resources. And I do wanna emphasize, I think a lot of you have really shown a lot of passion and interest in wanting to take action. So we definitely wanna encourage you to take part, um, whether that's digitally right now. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can learn more yourself. I think that's kind of the first step. So take a look at this presentation more in depth. Um, we'll be sure to share out some more resources tonight and take a look at those reports that were linked out here too. That's another great way. Um, and so especially with Earth Day and this focus coming up, I think it's an awesome opportunity for us to just dive a little deeper. Maybe you take a class on this. Um, there's a lot of cool options out there. So I definitely encourage you to learn more and learn more with your club and your Unite teams, you name it, um, and take action with the advocacy action. So we'll do everything that we can. Um, we're still very impactful even while we're social distancing. Um, so thank you all for joining. Thank you, Alicia. We're so glad to have you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. It was great to talk to you all. Have a good night. Bye. Be safe out there. <laughs>